Mark Richt in the U breezing through game number one of his tenure there at Miami over uh, Florida A&M 70-3. We bring in a Cam Underwood from the State of the U to help us uh, not so much talk about that game, but uh, what it means, what's going on with the football team as uh, the competition will gear up here in the next two to three weeks. All right, Cam, need to address this linebacking situation. Uh, it uh, You could look at it from the bright side or the not so bright side that you started three True freshmen, Shaq Quarterman, Zach McLeod, Michael Pinckney uh, in game number one, and you've had some off-field issues that have kind of resulted in this situation at linebacker. Yeah, linebacker is uh, it's going to be a focus for the Miami Hurricanes this season and everybody who watches uh, the team play. Um, so let me start with what happened on the field. You have Shaq Quarterman as your middle linebacker, um, U.S. Army All-American led that game in tackles last year, um, and he was an early enrollee. Actually, all three linebackers were early enrollees. So they, I'm, I'm calling them freshmores right now because they're not necessarily freshmen, but they're not sophomores. But uh, you know, Quarterman was one of the ones that in the previous video I spoke about how his defense uh, in high school was the exact same defense as we're running now. So this, you know, transition of of scheme and paradigm fits him perfectly. Uh, Michael Pinckney, uh, the weak side linebacker, he came in and was uh, reported in a different article uh, that I forget who wrote that, but some uh, a, you know full time credential beat what writer wrote that one. Um, that the terminology from Pinckney's defense is the literal exact same. So you have the same scheme for Quarterman, and then the same scheme and terminology for Pinckney. So Pinckney's like, oh, we call that exactly the same thing. I don't even need to learn. There's no barrier of, of terminology there. Um, and Zach McLeod is, he was my favorite of those three recruits. He went to Santa Lucia's High School, which is uh, the school that gave the University of Miami Vince Will four years ago. Um, it's funny, uh, after the game in the interview room, Shaq Quarterman talked, and you know, obviously they're friends. They all came in early. Uh, and they're all starting from day one. And, you know, Quarterman's like, okay, you know, as the middle linebacker, I'm kind of the cerebral one. You know, I'm giving the calls to defense. You know, I'm trying to make sure everybody's there. I'm trying to, you know, not get too high or too low. Mike Pinkney, he's energy all day. Like, he's the loud one, jumping up and down in your face, all that bravado, what you think of a Miami Hurricane uh, should be. And then Zach McLeod, he said, you know, he's a silent assassin. Like, and uh, he will just hit you, and he will hit you hard. And defensive coordinator Manny Diaz said uh, at the end of camp that Zach McLeod is the hardest hitter on our team, bar none, as a true freshman. Uh, 6'3", 220 for him. Quarterman is about 6'1", 2, 235. Pinckney, uh, you know, 6'1", 230, uh, 225, 230, but can really move. So, you know, they have uh, different skill sets, all three. Um, but I think that that's what makes them work well together also, you know, so you don't have just three clones, but you have three guys with a little bit different skill sets. So, you know, you can have the bigger McLeod, you know, if you're walking down to a 50 front, you know, if you're playing a team like Wisconsin, who's going to want to run the ball, you know, instead of just having, you know, four linemen and three linebackers behind them, you can kind of flex him down. He was, uh, what's that called? Under coverage or under set uh, on the defensive formation. So then he can, you know, be right there with the tight end because he has a little bit more physicality. So, you know, Shaq Quarterman led the team, or was uh, sorry, second in the team in tackles in the opener with seven. He had uh, an ooh hit, you know, and I was sitting there, you know, just watching the game and everything, and uh, the whole he hit a running back very, very hard. You know, it was one of those Benzo Perryman kind of ooh, you know, when he hit him kind of thing. So you're going to see a lot of that from him. That was I showed you the video last time of when he hit the kid in high school and he went flying about five yards back. So uh, not as far uh, with this one, but a similar kind of thing. So. Uh, you know, the, the thing with that is they the three freshmen have a lot of talent. Uh, and like I said, they have variegated skill sets, so they can do a lot of different things and they can stay in there for a lot of the different defenses that we're trying to run, obviously, when we're in base defense. The problem is going to come with experience and wrinkles going forward. So we play at, at Appalachian State in two weeks on September the 17th. If you saw that game against Tennessee that they played, that's a team that runs the ball. That's a team that runs the ball with a, a fun offense. You know, they have a lot of orbit motion. You know, they do a lot of, you know, option kind of things, the misdirection, you know. So 
alignment, assignment, and technique are the three things that you have to have on defense. And the first thing that the deep, that the linebackers are going to need to get is that alignment. And I saw even against FAMU, there was a little bit of, okay, wait, the strength of this formation isn't to, to our right, it's to our left. So we got to switch that real quick between McLeod and Pinckney. So you see them sprinting across to get to the other side of the formation. So there were even a couple of times then, uh, you know, this Saturday when – that kind of wasn't a hundred percent set as early as I would have liked to have seen it. When you're playing at Appalachian State, when you're playing at Georgia Tech, another triple option team where the linebackers are such an integral part because you know Georgia Tech they want to cut block every single play. They want to take the legs out from the defensive lineman. And that puts the onus on the linebackers to be in the right spot and play their technique so, and their assignment sound because when you have multiple guys going who could potentially get or have the ball, that is the integral part of the defense, especially going against an option. So, you know, a lot of good things from the linebackers, from the freshmen. I like the energy. I like the performance. Uh, but obviously, this is a lower tier school that we played. Um, and we're just going to really have to lean on them uh, going forward. As soon as you started to talk about uh, personalities and approaches to the game and how they differ, I kind of went back in my mind to the Giants' great linebacking core with LT and Carl Banks, the Pittsburgh Steelers with Lambert and Ham. Uh, it's interesting with linebackers, you need the cerebral guy, the guy that's going to get everybody lined up and in the right place and, and run the defense, call the plays. Then, yeah, you usually, if you have a great linebacking core, you've got a crazy guy, you've got, you've got different personalities and approaches to the game, and it fits and it works together. Yeah, um, but, you know, that that's going to be a great thing for us, hopefully, with those three. Uh, but touching back on your earlier question, uh, they're going to be playing a lot because we've lost a lot at linebacker. Um, Jawan Young was kind of quietly dismissed off of the team in the summer uh, for the rental car fiasco that I'm sure that you've probably heard about. Um, and the fact that he was gone so early kind of, I they didn't say this, but it kind of tells me that it was pretty confirmed really early that he was guilty or he did whatever they said that he did. So he shuttled off the, you know, off the team. He was a middle linebacker. He was probably going to start. Um, so he's gone. You have Jermaine Grace, uh, the leading returning tackler, the most experienced player at the position, um, start, starting strong side linebacker. He just got dismissed along with al Muhammad, Muhammad, a starting defensive end uh, on August 27th. So just about a week ago. Um, so you lose Young and Grace to the same rental car fiasco thing. Grace just had a, or hired a new lawyer. He might appeal to try to get back on the team, but I don't think that that's going to happen. So, you know, so you're still stuck with the three freshmen or you are playing the three freshmen. I still love them, but, you know, they're young. You just, um, Darian Owens was starting at an outside backer last year and then he tore up a knee. So he's on his way back into the rotation, hopefully. Um, so that could be some added depth coming soon uh, from a, a very talented player. He's, you know, 6'3", 225, 230, I want to say. Uh, so, you know, big guy could play, you know, either the outside linebacker positions. And then in the opener, we lost Jamie Gordonier, a redshirt freshman linebacker, to a knee injury for the season. So, uh, you know, you've lost Young and Grace and now Gordonier off, of off of the depth chart. You have Owens, who's not fully back on the depth chart, you know, and then behind those guys, you know, you have a Mike Smith from Miami Northwestern who, you know, he played the end in high school. Now he's playing middle backer. He had some decent snaps. Uh, you know, you have a Terry McRae from Blanche Ely who, I mean, he should play about five snaps a game, preferably on special teams. He's not really an impact player, but you have, you know, some other bodies there. But, you know, it's really going to be the freshman show this year. You know, the new Bermuda Triangle for the Miami Hurricanes. So they're just going to have to they have to grow up fast and it's really, you know, it's, it's to the point where we don't have many other options uh, to run out there. So uh, I know that, you know, a lot of people are, 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 are lowering their uh, expectations for what the record will be this year based upon that fact. And, you know, I spoke earlier about, you know, playing in Appalachian state and playing in Georgia tech and playing, you know, a, a, a North Carolina with Larry Fedora's offense uh, where, you know, they're going to go fast and they're going to go fast all day and you got to stop them and the linebackers are integral and they're going to highlight that, you know, they're going to um, put those guys in one-on-one -on -one situations. They're going to put them in a situation where they need to make a choice. They're going to, you know, option, they're going to have, you know, coverage. They're going to have to really, you know, do these things uh, really quickly on the fly. Um, and it's, I'm not saying that they can do it because we've seen them do it for one week. Now I know again, it was FAMU and it wasn't, you know, Florida state, but uh, 
you know, it's going to, the defense is going to go as the, the linebacking trio of freshmen go. And, you know, that really is going to put other pressure on the defensive line in the secondary. But yeah, at linebacker, we're really, really thin right now. And it's just how it is. So let's ride. In uh, talking to some other bloggers, looking at some other teams over the weekend, uh, talking about big teams playing overmatched teams in week one that didn't have the quarterback play that you have, they aired it out. For example, your favorite team, the Florida Gators, threw it 44 times because they've got a new starting quarterback. He's never started a game before, Luke Del Rio. They're trying to work on the passing game. You got the proven guy at quarterback. He only threw it 18 times. He saw some Malik Rozier in the game. Instead, you pounded the rock, and that's what Mark Richt is known for. Um, obviously, uh, there was a statement made there in terms of what kind of team we're going to be on offense. Yeah, um, and Mark Richt has said that from the beginning. He wants to run the ball. He wants to be a physical team. He doesn't want to – you know, we talked about last year how – or in previous years, you know, Miami third and one, third and goal from the two. You know, they're in shotgun. You know, they're doing those kind of things is no, we're not going to we're not going to be that. We're going to lean on you. We're going to hit you in the mouth metaphorically and we're going to pound the rock. We're going to run the ball. That's a shout out to JT Wilcox. And that's one of his things. Uh, Ryder down here is talking about some high school stuff. And I even, you know, for, for college stuff, run the ball. And that's what Mark Rick wants to do, you know, and Thomas Brown, the offensive coordinator. I know that Rick calls the plays, but, you know, Brown is the O.C. He was a running back for. Uh, Ricked at Georgia, you know, in a rotation. So obviously using multiple running backs uh, to great effect uh, and really putting the onus on the offensive line to be better than they were last year because, again, they were terrible. Uh, in case you've forgotten or haven't seen one of these videos before, they were really, really bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, the number one rushing offense, unless, excuse me, unless Florida State or Old Miss just go ridiculously insane tonight, the number one rushing offense in FBS football right now is the Miami Hurricanes, 373 yards on 36 carries. We had three running backs, Mark Walton, your starter, Joseph Yearby, uh, the 1A, and Gus Edwards, the 2 or 3, whatever you want to call them. All three of those guys went over 100 yards. That's the first time we've had that happen since 1987. That was a national championship year. Oh, by the way, I'm not saying no championship. I'm saying it's been 20 years. Wait, wait. 30 years, excuse me. Oh, uh, man, that just means I'm getting older. Anyway, but it's been 30 years since we've had three running backs get 100 yards in the game. And I know that all three of them, well, I don't know if all three, I know that two of the three, Yearby and Walton, had their career-long rushing touchdown in that game. I think Gus Edwards did two. He had a 74-yarder to end the third quarter. So, you know, we, we ran the ball. And that's going to hopefully that practice against, you know, somebody else is going to come in handy later on this season. Now, you know, that's that's really what we want to do. Mark Walton is the starter. He's really kind of separated himself from the other two. Joseph Yearby is very, very good back at a thousand yards last season. I don't think he's going to get that this year because, you know, Walton's in front of him and you're going to have uh, Edwards in there as well. Again, I, I said that this is like uh, the Auburn trio from years ago, but maybe the diet version of that, the Cadillac Williams, Ronnie Brown, and Brandon Jacobs before he left to Southern Illinois. We have a similar kind of trio right now of NFL caliber players at running back, and they showcased those talents. So uh, getting those reps and really just running a lot of the base plays that we're going to run in the running game this year uh, is good because you have to have those staples. You have to, you know, okay, I need three yards. I'm going to run. Insert play here. I don't know what you want to call it. You can call it lead, ISO, power, you know, any of those things. Or, well, I mean, you don't call them those things. Or those are all different kinds of plays. But if you're going to go to that play in, you know, against Florida State in a game that really, you know, you're going to have uh, a very tightly contested game, you're going to run those against FAMU to make sure that you have all the details put together. Um, so, again, 373 yards in the opener is huge. That's massive, you know. and uh, that's just really what we're looking for. I'm not really concerned about Brad. I think we're going to talk about him in a minute, but saw enough from him, but really leaning with the running game, that's positive for me. Yeah, along with the 373 on the ground, five touchdowns on the ground, and it's good to see, and again, the stats put into the context of facing FAMU. Uh, defensively, though, I, I saw a number of teams this First week, they got pushed around and, and a little bit by the inferior foe. So this is a statement, too. 22 yards rushing allowed on 42 carries, a half yard per carry. So the defensive front did the job. Yeah, and, you know, 
it's it was just a breath of fresh air. The leading tackler I thought was Shaq Quarterman, except for it wasn't. And I just saw it was defensive tackle Richard McIntosh. So, you know, that's just a, a 100% paradigm shift from previous uh, with that. You have defensive tackles getting up the field. He was a basketball player at Cardinal Gibbons down here in Fort Lauderdale. Um, basketball, football combo guy, 6'5", really long. Uh, he's up to probably about 280-ish um, uh, weight-wise. So, you know, he moved from end to tackle, you know, because we went 3-4 to 4-3. So he went from a 3-4 end to a 4-3 tackle. You know, a lot of people have been saying, you know, uh, I don't know if I want him at tackle, put him back at end. You know, we lost al Muhammad. Mohammed. Trent Harris just broke a hand, so he played some. But, you know, he has the club on his left hand right now because he just broke it and everything. Hey, let's put him over there. And I'm like, throughout the fall, the top two D tackles have been Kendrick Norton and Richard McIntosh has been your one. You know, so, like, let's not move him. Let's leave him there. And then you see in this first opening game that that kind of came to fruition in a positive way that he had a really great, uh, great game. Um, you know, so I, I did see that Coach Kulagowski, our defensive line coach, the best defensive line coach in America, thank you so much for him, Missouri, uh, has said that pretty much everybody is cross-training at end and tackle who has the size to do so. So that means McIntosh is cross-training there. Gerald Willis the third, who was suspended for the opener, five-star recruit a couple years ago, went to Florida, transferred over, so now he's eligible here. Uh, he's cross-training there also. Um, you know, a couple other guys. Um, so we're going to have, you know, we have some depth uh, and the defensive line at the ends. Uh, it, it was just, it was so great to see Chad Thomas, a five-star recruit uh, hype before the game and then making plays in the game, just getting up the field. His high school teammate, Demetrius Jackson, who was a full-time basketball player, only played one year of high school football. Uh, and now, you know, is a redshirt sophomore. So he's three years in uh, now he's making plays. He's getting up the field. So those 2014 Booker T. Washington, and tight end our defensive ends they're making plays you got joseph jackson who i talked to you about before said that he was a cyborg he's now second team uh at viper is what we call the one defensive end position i love it so he's second team viper number 99 looking like a cyborg he's out there making plays uh pat bethel whose father randy bethel played on a national championship team here at miami he came in and he made uh so he was not supposed to be on punt block but somebody couldn't get out there in time. So he rushes on for punt block on the first punt of the season and does what? Blocks the punt. Like, we got guys on the front line who are making plays now, and I'm excited about it. We had 18 tackles for loss, I want to say. We held, you know, it was kind of, we had a little lapse in the second quarter defensively. You know, we let FAMU kind of get a couple drives, had a couple missed uh Missed coverage assignments. They got a field goal, so that's the only reason we didn't shut them out was one of those drives in the second quarter. Came out in the third quarter and held them to negative two total yards on 19 plays. Adjustments and elite performance. I love it. Yeah, so you mentioned Kaya. Uh, he threw 18 passes, four touchdowns. Uh, if he can keep that up throughout the season, then then we've got something going. But uh, then he hit, he hit the bench. Uh, I don't know what you want to say about Bradway. He's a known commodity. Uh, in terms of anything else uh, across the board, offense or defense, that needs to be uh, addressed here? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, we should have a conversation about Brad Kaya just because there's been so much conversation about Brad Kaya in our and other spaces uh, throughout, you know, the social media and, and Internet. Um, he is one of the top players at quarterback in the country. Uh, and like you said, you know, other teams are trying to figure out their situation, and ours is cemented in stone. You know, it's a uh, – you know, he's not going anywhere. And that's a that's a great thing just to have an elite level player like that at that position. Now, uh, Brad talked about it after the game, you know, the fact that he only had, you know, 12 completions for 137 yards or something like that, you know. Uh, so he hit two thirds of his throws, 12 out of 18, uh, had four touchdowns. So one out of every three completions went for a score, which is uh, really good, by the way. Uh, so, you know, he he played a good game. He wasn't great. Uh, he missed David Njoku. He kind of so. Um, Quick set, looked left, wasn't there, wasn't there. Scrambled to his right, uh, and David Njoku kind of had a stop or an out route or something, and then he turned it up the sideline and was, I mean, butt naked wide open doing, you know, backflips and cartwheels. Uh, it could have been. And Brad just missed him. He just sailed it into, like, the third row. Just, I mean, it was, I mean, and he was asked after the game if he could have any throw back to have over again, and that was the one he talked about. He said, yo, I missed David up the sideline. That would have been an easy touchdown. That's a throw that I make. You know, 99 times out of 100, and I don't know why, but, you know, I missed that one. Got to be better. Um, he had a 50-yarder or 48-yarder to a true freshman a receiver, Amon Richards, uh, down the middle and was kind of underthrown. 
a little bit. So he missed that. If he throws it out there earlier or longer, that's a touchdown. Uh, it was kind of on his back hip as he's trying, or Rich as he's trying to catch it. And in the process of rolling over, he lost the ball. And uh, we tried to run up to the line to run the next play, but it was overturned on replay. Um, so that was another throw that he missed. Um, that was open. And, you know, he talked about the fact that the, the Kings defense is built to take away those shots vertical. So he wasn't necessarily, uh, he didn't read that as quickly as he otherwise would have. So, you know, there were reasons for it, but, you know, a good performance, not a great performance. A great performance is hitting both of those. You have a little bit of extra yardage and you probably have two more touchdowns um, from him. So, you know, had six receivers catch the 12 balls, um, you know, uh, grad transfer fullback Marquez Williams had a touchdown. Stacy Coley, uh, you know, the best player at receiver, he had a touchdown. I'm on Richards, like I said, on a different play, he had a touchdown. And then uh, who was the fourth one? Herndon, I want to say. Yeah, Chris Herndon was the fourth uh, touchdown uh, receiver, the starting tight end uh, in front of Najoku. So, you know, he, he did a good job spreading the ball around. Obviously, the operation at the line of scrimmage was great, getting the offense over, you know, 540 yards total offense. So uh, there will be better days on, you know, the statistics side where he throws for more yards and has more pass attempts and things like that. So, you know, I think it was a solid start. It wasn't, you know, super uber duper you know the best player ever in the history of life start but you know uh brad kai is better than pretty much any other quarterback that we're going to see this year and i'm happy with what he did uh the schedule ramps up it almost goes in levels of sorts so so florida atlanta coming up this week i would expect them to give you a little bit more resistance you're still a huge favorite but they beat uh southern illinois 38 30 then uh the, the aforementioned app state which would have not registered on just about anybody's radar maybe before they gave Tennessee fits in overtime, should have won the game. So that's coming up in two weeks, and then you dive into the ACC. So you got some some time to ramp up and look at some other young players, anybody that you'd like to see really stand out over the next couple of games in preparing for the better teams. Yeah, you know, the, the schedule does ramp up. You know, we were, a, you know, 57, 58-point favorite last week against uh, Florida A&M. Uh, we covered that spread. Uh, <laughs> opened as a 23-point favorite against FAU. Um, you know, and that's a plucky little team, you know, so obviously, and everybody, you know, at the podium, Mark Rick, Manny Diaz, uh, even the players post game, you know, on the interview, and they say, you know, this team is going to be a, a, I mean, they simply overmatched. That was, that was a buy game, you know, we, we paid them a bunch of money. They brought down their team, they brought down their band, you know, one of the best bands in America, some say the best, best band in America, you know, the Marching 100, you know, uh, influx of cash into their athletic department you know we beat them badly don't hurt anybody you know we don't want that you know just kind of move them all along uh fau is going to be you know a little bit of a tougher game you know should win you know comfortably you know four touchdowns five touchdowns somewhere in there uh you know and then at appalachian state you know that's a good team i know you know we've talked about it before right over my head right here is what the university of michigan stadium i know that they beat michigan in 2000 and whatever five seven yeah i know like we we all know that when that game hit the schedule you know there's a lot of people who are like whoa like Miami's going to Boone North Carolina like that's crazy that we are even in you know have to do that and I think that was because somebody dropped out of the schedule and you know they were the team that could say it and you know or that could take us on and then they said well you know you're the ones who need a game and we need a marquee game so you're going to come up here this year right now uh, and that's just something that kind of happened so you know that's what's looking uh, ahead of us in front of the bye. And then, like you said, you know, into the October that I'm sure we'll talk about later, but just running through that quickly at Georgia Tech, Florida State, North Carolina, uh, somebody else, and then at Notre Dame. So, yeah, October is going to be, you know, challenging. So uh, looking for the linebackers to really just kind of continue to play at an excellent level, I would like to see um, – Deontay Mullins, who was a four-star recruit, get integrated a little bit more into the passing game. He was the last player on the team to qualify or get admitted or through the clearinghouse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so he's a little bit behind everybody else. Um, I want to continue to see Amon Richards play well. I want to continue to see, um, you know, Joseph Jackson and, you know, the other young defensive ends, you know, uh, Pat Bethel. I want to see him play well. And I really am just the, the secondary, we're going to have to lean on the secondary so much. I know that we're going to play a lot of nickel and dime, especially when you're, you're going forward a little bit. So just really want to make sure that they continue to tackle well. That's something that Manny Diaz, our defensive coordinator, praised the defensive backs for in the opener. Uh, and again, I know that we're across the board better athletes than FAMU, but you know, still being able to execute the tackling at that kind of a level. Uh, and I just want to see efficiency. 
I don't want to see a lot of the, you know, operational or stupid penalties. I just want to see us be quick and clean and efficient. And whether that means in and out of the huddle on offense, uh, you know, success rate and running completions and, you know, proper routes on offense, you want to see, you know, no missed tackles or as few missed tackles as possible. You know, you want to get up the field. You want to wreak some havoc in the backfield, all those kind of things. I just want to see, and we're not going to probably see the same score line again. So I'm not saying that we're going to see a 70 to three next week or the week after. I don't think that that's realistic, but I want to see the same kind of performance. I want to see the same kind of energy. I want to see the same kind of efficiency. And I want that to, that first win against FAMU, the way that we did it, I want that to become our habit. I want that to become our MO moving forward. Because again, in October and November, when the lights are on and those are tougher games against ACC opponents and you know on the road, you know, we go to North Carolina State, which is one of the, you know, 10 toughest places to play in America because it gets loud over there in that stadium. You know, I want to see that we have already established who we are and how we do things and we continue to execute just like we did. Yeah, the uh, the start soft and for a conference schedule, the end is kind of soft with Virginia, North Carolina State and Duke. But in between, it's, uh, yeah, October, first week of November, five straight. That's just about as difficult as any you're going to find. Florida State, North Carolina, Virginia Tech, Notre Dame, Pitt. So there it is. That's going to be the season right there. Man, yeah, that's a uh, – and then – let me see. If you started with Florida State, you back that up one week, and then you got Georgia Tech at the top of that. So you're talking six weeks in a row, you know, because there's it's the weird thing where there's five Saturdays in October this year. So you know, you got five Saturdays in October, and that first one in in uh, in, in November. Oh yeah, and we go to Virginia Tech on a Thursday night before uh, the Notre Dame game. That's the game I was missing uh, in in October. So you have four of those Saturdays in October, and then a Thursday for us. You know, that's the traditional Miami Hurricane Thursday night game. You know, we're gonna play it on the road because. In South Florida, there's just so much to do that you're not going to sell out that stadium eh, it, on a Thursday. That's what it's going to be. Although we had really good attendance this week, um, 60,000 plus. Um, and I know that that's a factor of, you know, having Mark Rick there. We have 40, um, 40,000 plus season ticket holders now, uh, you know, got the redesigned and uh, upgraded stadium. They did the second tier of that kind of stuff. And it, listen, it gets loud in there now. It has that kind of um european soccer stadium feel to it now with the kind of half uh covering with the opening in the middle and you know i was sitting in the press box and they have you know the sliders of glass you know so they open them up so we can you know kind of hear the hear the fans get the feel for the game so you kind of get a little bit more of that while you're up there and i was talking to my neighbor in the press box and i was like i want to hear you know what what does full voice sound like you know we got sixty thousand people in here you know so the opening kickoff you probably had 45,000 people cheering at about 80% volume. You know, the first drive of the season, uh, we played defense first. Flam you threw an interception to Corn Elder. So he jumped the route, kicked it off. The first third down of the year was an interception. Um, and it got loud. And I'm looking around like, man, for that Florida State game, because we only have – we have that game against FAMU. We have this week against uh, FAU. Then we're on the road to App State. We have a bye week. We're on the road at – uh, Georgia Tech, and then October eighth, North Carolina. Or sorry, Florida State. It's gonna be loud in there. It is. It's a different kind of stadium, man. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. You can see, you know, all through, you know, the the infrastructure. You know, going uh, into the bowels of the stadium, walking to the interview room. You saw, you know, all the the walls and the wiring. And you can tell there's things inside the walls you can't see that have been upgraded, and there's things outside that you can see that are. I mean, it's just. It's nice. The 4K screens in every corner. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, it's it's gonna be a good time. So, uh, you know, I know that I don't even remember what the initial question was or what I started talking about, but uh, suffice it to say that I am sufficiently excited for Miami Hurricanes football right now. Very cool. Cam Underwood, State of the U, always delivers for us. So we always appreciate you taking the time, Cam. This is good stuff always, even after a 70-3 to game when there would apparently be not a whole lot to talk about in terms of buzz of the last game or going into Florida Atlantic. You, you still deliver. Well, you know, uh, they delivered me such great content this week, you know, but I always appreciate being on here. And, you know, uh, it just – I'm glad that we have the, a blowout kind of thing to talk about and not a 38 to 10 against Bethune Cookman. You know, uh, there are things that, like we said, there are things to improve, but there's also a lot to like. So, um, you know, I know it's only one game for Mark Rick, and I know it's the beginning of this era, but I'm excited and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens this year. All right. Hopefully we can catch up soon, man. Appreciate it. Definitely. No problem. See you.